Brendan Lawfridge, welcome to Acquiring Minds. Thanks for having me. Brendan, today we're going to talk about the intersection of ETA, entrepreneurship through acquisition, and real estate. And that intersection occurs in property management businesses. You bought one and you own a real estate portfolio. So we're going to hear all about how the two of those interact, complement each other or don't. But let's start off with some background on you, please, Brandon. Tell us about your journey to leading up to buying a property management business. Sure. Um, I uh, am currently located in Kansas City, and that's where I was born and raised. Uh, went to the University of Missouri. After college, I uh, moved out to San Diego. Um, but prior to moving to San Diego, I had the good fortune of working for some very entrepreneurial uh, guys in some brothers. That's why I say guys in Columbia, Missouri, where the University of Missouri is, uh, and that led to starting a business kind of right as I was getting out of college. And that business was internet based and very portable, and uh, had some family in San Diego and a business partner that was in love with San Diego. So we ended up taking that business out uh, to San Diego right after I graduated from college. Um, that was uh, 2010. We lived out in San Diego for about four years, ended up uh, growing, selling that business, um, had an opportunity to uh, kind of take a detour and join a private equity firm. Uh, obviously, I did not have a traditional private equity background. Uh, and that was sort of my entree into officially doing something related to entrepreneurship through acquisition. Uh, I had been sort of a, a hobbyist researcher prior to, to making that turn um, and then uh, ended up coming back to Kansas City, working for that private equity firm for a little while, um, launching a business that failed uh, after leaving that and then realizing, okay, I need to buy a business here. I, I liked doing that for the private equity firm, but I didn't really want to be transactional. Uh, I would I would like to buy something and focus on it um, and ended up buying North Terrace, my property management business in 2017. So coming up on seven years here in the spring. And where does real estate fit into all of this? Tell us about your portfolio. Sure. So that um, internet business that I mentioned uh, starting out of college uh, it was basically, it eventually morphed into kind of just an online agency type of a business, search engine optimization being the core service that we offered. And anyone that's ever spent any time either in that world directly or um, has gotten into it to, you know, do SEO for their, for their business or for whatever reason knows that um, it's a very, very rapidly changing industry. That's sort of the only thing that stays the same in digital marketing, <laughs> specifically in SEO. And uh, a sp when your full business is based around that, it feels very fleeting and like Google at any moment could change something and kind of put you out of business. So I'd always had an interest in real estate. And in my opinion, that was kind of the opposite of uh, something where, you know, just a single change by one company could put you out of business. It's sticks and bricks and very basic and um, illiquid and very slow moving. So I started basically taking the money that I was making off of that business and what I could afford to uh, investing in real estate. And were these investments or did you perceive that you would make a career in real estate? I think at the time I, I wasn't necessarily... Um, planning on making a full-time career out of it. I had just, um, it was 2010, like I said, when we started that business. And I think that was, yeah, that was also when I bought my first investment property. And at that time in Kansas City, as a result of the great financial crisis, kind of 08, 09, you could buy a great house for thirty to $50,000. And the main wow limiting factor was basically how much stamina you had to look at properties in a day that were just listed on the MLS. It was not that deals were hard to find. So, wow. uh, yeah, I mean, huge regret now. It's easy to say in hindsight, but it would have been amazing to, uh, 
to have focused on it at that point in time and raised a bunch of money and bought, you know, you could have bought thousands of houses like that, that today are, you know, 150 to $200,000. Wow. I, I remember, of course, that time very well. And I remember hearing about the the most hammered markets. You, they just come up all the time in the news. Vegas, Miami. Um, what were some of the other ones? I mean, where, where speculation, you know, where the growth and speculation had been mo- had been peaking, of course, is where where it hurt the most. But um, I don't remember hearing about Kansas City one way or the other. Uh, but that's that is quite a collapse, and then uh, and then you know, back getting re- a return to normal over what has it been thirteen years from yeah. thirty fifty thousand dollars to one hundred fifty two hundred. Collapse was certainly not as dramatic as those places you mentioned, or Phoenix, some of the other yeah, kind of Sunbelt type markets. Um, right, but uh, it was significant, and interestingly, something that I noticed early and what attracted me um, to continue pursuing this was the rents did not have the same uh, reaction as the price of the homes. Rents didn't go down, essentially. Um, They kind of moved up over time. Yeah. Uh, So the kind of fundamental value, if you just think about it from purely a value perspective, you could make a very clear arithmetic argument that they're just very solid, you know, assets to acquire. Great. Well, Brandon, one of the things that strikes me about this uh, 13, 15 years going back to to you getting out of college is that you had some zero to one entrepreneurship experience. You had online digital uh, business experience, then private equity, real estate on the side, you're building this portfolio and then and then buying a business ultimately. So you could have taken any of those and made a career out of them. Um it, was there any, and, and where you have landed is that you're essentially a real estate guy, but also kind of an ETA guy. You bought a business that complements your real estate portfolio. We're going we're gonna to hear all about that. I'm just curious if, um, if there were, why do you think you landed on, on the path that you did when you could have followed any of those into, uh, into, into careers? I mean, digital is its own career. PE is its own career. Real estate is its own career, the one you took, et cetera. Well, in terms of like making real estate my career, I knew that mm-hmm. I didn't want to um, go be a broker or a lender or something like that. Um, sort of a solo uh, business where there's not much enterprise value to it. You can certainly make a lot of money. And I would say um, from 2017, when I bought my business until a year and a half ago, could have made far more money being a broker, theoretically, um, than owning a property management company. But I was just kind of um, long-term oriented in my thinking and wanted to build something with enterprise value, not just you know uh, a Rolodex that in good times you can make a lot of money, but then in bad times you're scrambling, basically, which is what a lot of brokers are doing now. I mean, transactions are obviously way, way down. So to answer the real estate portion of your question, um, I landed on, I wanted an operating business that could somehow kind of fuel and support um, focusing on building a portfolio over time. And I was not, you know, independently wealthy and able to just go buy enough real estate that I could manage it, you know, as my full-time job. So, Mm -hmm. um, but then in terms of landing on real estate, I had already, you know, been buying and building a small portfolio. Um, and I was, I had kind of gotten to the point where it was annoying as a side hustle and I needed to hire a property management company. Um, and I went through the process of, of looking, well, I used a third party property management company at one point and that was a pretty terrible experience. Um, I wouldn't say that I was, uh, sophisticated at all in how I vetted that group. It was just a referral and went with it and it was a terrible experience. Um, so then I started digging into the space and, um, for as much, uh, uh, flack, I guess, as it gets as an industry. And it is certainly difficult. There's also a lot of opportunity, um, and a lot of, you know, kind of bolt on businesses that you can build around it, even outside of the very obvious, let's use it to build a portfolio that we would manage. Um, and I had sort of separate from that decision-making process decided that while it was exciting to, uh, look at deals and buy businesses for that private equity firm. I got a lot more excited about uh, 
doubling something that you already owned than um, the inorganic growth of let's just buy more and more and more. Um, it's a lot more exciting to make a change in a business and see it forever improved over, you know, oftentimes relatively simple things. I know that at this point, the cliche is, you know, get rid of the fax machine. I think that's like the uh, SMB mm -hmm. Twitter cliche, uh, but there's a lot of things like that. And it's just, it's more exciting and interesting um, to do that and go deeper in one business to me than it is to just buy more and more and more businesses. So I think it was just the convergence of all those factors basically led me to, hey, the shortest path to get to where I want to go is buy an operating business and that operating business should be in real estate. And if it's in real estate, here's what makes sense. Yeah. And did you ever consider understanding that you had a real estate portfolio, that you were already feeling the, this pain point of property management, um, you needing to outsource property management, seeing that the, the, what was on offer out there wasn't good, you could probably do better. Uh, but did you ever consider buying a different type of business outside of real estate? buying you know the the hvac business or, or whatever or whatever it was because uh one thing just to fill in a little bit of a gap here you knew out in san diego you'd met tim ludwig uh who's a big name in search so you were pretty familiar with eta and search for some number of years and so your aperture was going to be wider than just oh let me buy a property management business you saw all of the all of the potential that was here uh in eta broadly um so did you ever consider buying something that wasn't directly applicable to your own real estate portfolio. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, looked at deals for years. Um, when we had that, uh, online marketing business that I mentioned, um, we had the good fortune of having, uh, an employee who then became a partner in the business. And obviously it was, I was very young. My partner is only a few years older than me. And this employee that we had who became a partner, uh, really kind of ran the whole business for us at a certain point and we, we were pretty free i mean i would say maybe i spent 20 hours a week on that business itself and the rest of my time was free and i didn't have any kids and um now it's one of those things where i see i see just how much free time i really had and wasted but um i would typically Brandon, did you quote put in an operator and it actually worked <laughs> uh well we were still there and no we wouldn't have phrased it that way at the time um, and we were, we were still involved in the business. Um, it's a, it's definitely different because it was not, um, yeah, just buying a business and putting somebody in and hoping it works out sort of thing. We had built the business and he was there early. Um, so yeah. really it was more of a, he was a business partner. Uh, yeah. it just didn't happen to found it, you know? Um, so no, I wouldn't classify it as, as the dream of putting in an operator. Um, but uh, anyway, so we filled our sort of spare time basically with just constantly looking at new opportunities, things that we felt like could scale much larger than that services business um, in retrospect uh, to the detriment of the services business because it was actually not as bad as we told ourselves it was as a business. But um, we, so we looked at deals for years in every space and we got close on some i mean just uh i feel like i looked at so many that now i've forgotten most of the specifics but i know at one point we uh we were fairly close on a um, fence installation business mm -hmm. in um orange county that was pretty mm -hmm. interesting um we dug pretty deep in the travel space at one point uh because that had become a little bit in vogue in the search fund world in the same way that like um, document management and some of those other uh, sort of classic search fund industries get kind of have a moment and shine bright and <clears throat> niche kind of travel tour operators where I think we had gotten kind of not far down the path, but somewhat serious about a, a business that took people on like niche vacations in Europe, basically like go see castles in Germany and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we had, I had looked at tons of obscure operating businesses with little to no common theme other than obviously we would hope there was some sort of way that, that we felt like there might be an edge in online marketing, um, that we could bring to the table.
And why do you think you'd ever closed on any of those if if the, if you this search, uh, such as it was, was going for so was lasting for so long? I mean, I think a lot of that searching predated uh, really my understanding of the SBA loan program. So oh. raising capital to uh, actually execute on one of those deals would have been. I mean, I feel like now I wouldn't, I would be very confident, but at the time to, you know, find a business that's $4 million in enterprise value and don't really understand that, Hey, there's this way to borrow 80 or 90% of that. Um, that would have certainly held us back. Um, and I don't know, we were fixated too on scalability to like an extreme degree. And like, we don't want to do this if it can't be a huge business. And I've certainly changed my thinking on that um, and care more sort of about durability of a business and the ability for that business to last a long time rather than quickly get really large. Um, so I think we would shut down a lot of opportunities for that reason. You know, it's a somewhat attractive business, but can we grow it to 50 or $100 million a year? No. Okay. We're not interested. Brandon, how how much damage has the you know kind of Silicon Valley giant, quick, like incredibly fast growing business that 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 is the bar that we were all shooting for? Uh, how much damage has it done? Lost opportunities, lost talent. Who for year you know people like you and me who for years didn't go do something because they thought that we had this unrealistically ridiculously high bar. Um, it's just, it's really actually quite frustrating as I articulate it. Well, it is, it's an extreme amount of damage. It would be, I'm sure somebody's done this, the research, obviously you could quantify that in a number of different ways, but it's, I think it's interesting how, and, and we weren't just to preface this a little bit, we weren't necessarily like, oh, we need to have, you know, a Facebook level outcome or something like that. But again, like on the level of what I was saying, 50, $100 million a year in revenue plus kind of opportunity, or this isn't worth worth our time. Um, and it's, I think it's caused a lot of damage because um, if you really look at who's successful, and, and this took me a few years to come around and see this, you look at who's successful in a community and who do you want to be? Uh, typically, it's it's the small business owner that has a pretty yeah. simple business and has just kind of um, incrementally made that better over time and, uh, you know, maybe bought some real estate or whatever. And it's just, uh, yeah, lifestyle business as a pejorative. Um, it's like the opposite right. to me, whatever the opposite of pejorative is a compliment, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that's what a lifestyle business is to me. That's the whole point of a business. Um, yeah. So yeah, it definitely caused us to waste a lot of time. Well, another another reaction to your story there. Boy, if you guys were turned on by the idea of buying a business, but you didn't know about the SBA possibility, that must have just gotten you really excited when you were like, you know, after years of thinking you were going to have to raise money from from investors or however you want to finance it, to then learn, holy smokes, we can do that. We, we can get 80 or 90% of this thing financed by a bank. Yeah, that must no, have been it an did. exciting moment. For sure. And I think there was two, like there was an initial couple of years where I just didn't even know about it. And it sounds funny now, but I think 10 years ago, it was a lot less common and there really weren't, um, you know, even today, a lot of people have the experience where they go into their local bank who says that they do SBA loans and you say, I want to buy a business with an SBA loan. And they say, well, you can't do that. It's for equipment or it's for real estate or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just their understanding of the program. Um, so there's still a lot of that sentiment out there kind of like in the non Twitter world. Um, and there weren't these like maybe live Oak bank, I'm sure it existed, but like, I don't think that there were these kind of will go any anywhere focused on ETA type lenders, um, that existed at that time. So it was definitely a much more niche thing, people doing it. Um, and then separate from that, the partner that I mentioned, who was a few years older, he had had a successful, uh, outcome prior to our business. So I'm not sure how keen he would have been on, like we were very married at the time, still good friends and partners on some real estate, but um, we sort of had a blood brother type situation where we did everything together and I would have and did, I think, write off opportunities that would need to be financed by things that were personally guaranteed because he wasn't interested in doing that. Yeah. yeah. 
Makes sense. But you're right. I mean, you know, it's it's so funny, one's own psychology. When you get into something, you assume that that's how things always were. So when I started learning about ETA and, you know, all the way back in 2021, just two years ago, uh, <laughs> SBA was well known, but that doesn't mean that it was 10 years before that. Like there's been a lot that's happened since from 2011 to 2021. So no, I explicitly remember that when I started researching using SBA loan <clears throat> to buy a business, um, there was like a handful of websites that even talked about it. And yeah. one in particular that had described uh, like the timeline of major changes to the SBA program that made it viable, including like raising the limit from 2 million to 5 million, which uh, I think happened 2014, 2015 ish, maybe a few years before that. But so it's, mm -hmm. it's only recently for sure that it's come into the mm -hmm. general consciousness and then with a sizing up of the limit as well. That's good. Um, history. I didn't know that. Another quick aside on this. So travel businesses. I, I can't even imagine what the the pitch is there. I know Greg Geronimus, big name in traditional search funds, had a travel business. I know Guesswork Investing Online looked at a travel business. But um, I mean, just indulge me. What, what What's the 30 second? Why did it have? Why did it ever have a moment, <laughs> a moment in in the sun from the search perspective? It doesn't seem to have any of the attributes that seem canonical today. Well, it doesn't have recurring revenue. However, um, a lot of niche travel businesses that have, um, you know, a good marketing pitch uh, or hook, like, um, okay, we're the uh, uh, adventure travel company to South America or something like yeah. that, or even that's not sure. a great example. Um, maybe cat, we're the castle tour company and or the architecture travel company. There is a very high repeat rate of customers. So it's certainly not ah. recurring, but um, there's the opportunity to build a really, really tight relationship. Uh, like you probably could, and I'm totally making this up. I'm not citing a study, but I bet if you did the research on the lifetime value of like a Viking cruise customer, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. definitely not one Viking cruise. I wouldn't be surprised if it's like four or five Viking yeah. cruises. Um, and I think the same would hold true in sort of these higher end niche travel businesses. They have a really interesting working capital um, kind of structure, uh, negative working sure. capital. So usually you're getting paid a year in advance or six months in advance, whatever it is. And then you're paying for everything as it happens. Um, yep. So that's really attractive. So you don't need any working capital essentially. And then if you've got a good model, um, you could obviously take that working capital or at least the profit portion of that working capital and expand into new tours, acquiring customers, whatever it is. And it could grow very fast, theoretically. Mm -hmm. um, so the specific one that we looked at was like European focused. And I think they had castle tours and things like that. And they had proven out that um, it did have a high repeat rate of of mm -hmm. business and it did have the really attractive working capital so i think those are the reasons that it was interesting and i don't know if you've planned a, a family vacation in the last few years it's a huge pain and yeah. there's almost uh and i know that's i'm saying family when this is the um typically the profile of somebody that does this is not a family but just planned a vacation period it's a huge yeah. pain and uh personally i've never used a tour company but uh, I could see the appeal for sure of just, yeah. here's what I want to do. And you figure out the logistics. I don't have to think about yeah. it. Well, thank you for that. And one thing, one more thing before we return to your story, you just touched on it and you said to said it to me explicitly in our pre-call as well. Um, essentially, you know, you had this, this agency, it was throwing off cash. Uh, you, I, I'm putting words in your mouth. I think I can't remember how you put it, but you didn't think it was that strong of business or that great of a, of a business. And so you were looking for something else. Uh, and you now see that differently. And uh, what is what, and, and I think what you said on the pre-call was, you know, back then you didn't look at service. You didn't smile upon service businesses generally. And now of course you love them. Um, you've, you've already glanced off it, but address that, that, uh, directly and how you've evolved your thinking there? Well, specifically the service that we 
offered there was link building in SEO, if you're familiar with that. But, sure. you know, just you've got to get links to pages to rank well or websites to rank well. Um, it's changed how you sort of qualify what a great link is. But um, in general, a link is a vote. You go out and get more yep. votes, you know. And we were at the higher end of that. You know, there's everything from you can do very spammy stuff um, up to, you know, the best is going to be if like the New York Times mentions you and it's just totally inorganic and or totally organic, excuse me. Um, you didn't do anything except maybe produce some amazing content to get a link. So that was the business we offered. Um, we, uh, our client base, however, was not the end user. It was large agencies where um, they would much rather, instead of building up a capability in-house to go out and get links, they would rather just have a price from somebody like us at that time and they can just mark it up or pass it on or whatever. It's um, you know just like a GC versus self-performing work. It's a lot easier yep. if you own the relationship to just mark something up. So we had quite a few really good high-level agency relationships. Uh, I mean, we had a ton of them, but if you look at the top customers that we had um, that were spending a lot with us, I mean, tens of thousands a month up to, you know, I think the top, top customers were probably over a hundred thousand a month and for years. Um, and just that feeling of Google being able to sort of theoretically shut our business off in any moment that constantly was rattling around in our brains. And, uh, so we would convince ourselves that, Hey, we shouldn't put much effort into this cause it could be gone at any moment. Yeah. Um, and we, <laughs> then allowed that to kind of creep into um, how we treated the rest of the business, I guess, because a, a more appropriate response would have been to say, well, what are other service lines that we could offer these customers since we have these great relationships? What are yep. other things that their clients need that they would love to just mark up us offering the service? And we've aggregated all this demand from a bunch of different agencies. So we can, even if they would perform it in-house. Maybe we can do it better or cheaper or whatever, because we've got, you know, we can keep a full-time team busy or whatever the thing is. That would have been a much better response than let's do something totally unrelated because uh, we just don't like the idea of this service business because it's never going to be, um, you know, a 50 or $100 million business. I think it probably could have been a $10 million business and probably yeah. with great margins. Um, yeah. So, uh, it was, that's great. It was definitely that's a, a lesson analysis. learned. Yeah. And so, and, and, and how does that fit into your, your overall evolution of going from an aversion to services businesses to an appreciation for them? Because is it kind of what we've already said that like, let's not fixate on 50 and a hundred million dollar opportunities, a $10 million business, which many, many, many services businesses can realistically get to can throw off, tw you know, two, three, four, maybe million dollars a year. Sounds pretty good to me sort of thinking. Yeah. And, and now it's kind of a, uh, thing that I, I will forget about, or I'll, you know, there's some shiny object that's starting to distract me, but thankfully I can, I shut that stuff down very quickly now and remembering <laughs> that feeling and how basically that that business still exists today uh and we sold it in 2014 and um one of our employees at that time also has started like the same business again and does very well with it so this business that in 2010 2011 we started and felt like it was going to go away at any moment so we wouldn't focus on it is still alive and doing well uh, you know, 13 years later. Um, so then I use that just again, as a reminder where, especially in my business now, because some of the issues sort of, um, rhyme with issues that we would have had mm. in that business, but there is no like Google that could turn it off. Um, so that was the primary problem that we had with that business always. Um, and just, you know, it's a, it's a good reminder and way to, uh, kind of keep myself grounded and focused on what I have that's working and just keep going. 
Well, I, I, I do want to just um, throw in my perspective here and make sure the, the audience is clear. Your concern that Google could, th- th- there was platform risk, what they call platform risk. Yeah. Like one change in the bowels of the Google organization or the Google algorithm could overnight sink that line of business. And that is a very valid concern. And there are countless examples of that happening with respect to SEO, with respect to e-commerce, if you're on Amazon, FBA businesses, basically any business that re- that somehow relies on one of the big, big, big f- platforms um, is very beholden to the whims of that platform or that algorithm. And it is a very, very real risk. So you were, and I know you're not saying the opposite, you were right to be concerned about that. But where, where you're saying you were wrong was the play was not to just exit digital agencies altogether. It would have been to spin up a different line or two or three of offerings to your to these great clients that you had and 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 reduce the over reliance on SEO link building stuff. Um, so yeah, just want to just want to make that clear that the platform risk that you guys perceived was real. And even though there are plenty of businesses today that make millions on Amazon or make millions on link building and SEO, they're very vulnerable. They're, they're they're just as vulnerable today as they were in 2014. Google itself, we're seeing with GPT, who knows what happens with consumer consumer habits around search. But I mean, there's a question today of whether SEO itself is is doomed. I'm now getting a little bit off track, but I wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> no, I do. Uh, I have thought about that for sure over the last year since I think it's been about a year since I started yeah. playing with uh, uh, Chat GPT and other AI stuff. And uh, yeah. The I would be absolutely frantic if we were in that business still, yeah. um, worried about what yeah. it looked like in the future. And one other thing I'll say about an agency business, I know you you and I both are my first million listeners, so we're familiar with a fan favorite guest, uh, uh, Andrew Wilkinson, who's who goes on that show quite a bit, and um, he'll be familiar to people on Twitter as well, holding company of uh, mostly or almost exclusively digital businesses. But Andrew uh, got his start buying businesses because he had an agency that grew over some number of years. Um, it's a kind of high end for startups, user experience. I think UX agency, Don't know. it's not ex- exactly, but it's some digital agency. And to your point, like he grew it to the point where it was throwing off a lot of cash. He owns it to this day. And it was his, you know, Warren Buffett has had his what? The insurance company or whatever, the, all, the, all the cash that was throwing off from being thrown off from his insurance float. Uh, Wilkinson and his team had the cash coming off of an agency that they then started uh, deploying into into acquiring businesses. So agencies can be, yeah, they can be good businesses to your Brent, point. Brent, be sure is basically the same story as well. Ah, uh, w- w- give us 30 seconds on that. Well, with he had an agency business and they, they spun off a lot of startups and uh, I don't know that any of those really became too much. Um, but then he went on to buy another agency business and kind of doubled down on their core and it was doing really well. And then they used the cash that they were earning off of those businesses to go and buy unrelated businesses and then built it to the level where, uh, it was a pretty impressive holding company before then. Now he does, you know, uh, institutional funds and has investors, but that was all with his own money and, you know, uh, kind of a a self-funded search before that was a term. Uh, great history there too. All right, Brandon, let, let's return to your story now. Okay, so you were in San Diego. You moved back to Kansas City. Uh, what year was that? And how big is your real estate portfolio at this point? That was 2014. And I think I had about 12 units. And is this when it's it's not for another three years that you buy North Terrace? So tell, tell us the story of the actual acquisition of North Terrace, where your property portfolio looks like, where you're living, etc. Sure. So I actually, prior to 2014, during that um, uh, period of time that I was talking about where, uh, you know, I'm spending half my time on the agency business and then the rest Mm -hmm. kind of exploring opportunities, um, I had talked to the owner, founder of North Terrace, um, and I had kind of reached out cold, obviously, and said, hey, I'm kind of interested in... Uh, buying a property management company in Kansas City. And there's not that many that look interesting to me because at that time I was pretty fixated on focusing on properties in a pretty tight geography in Kansas City. Um, Kind of cool, historic, 
kind of a hipstery type area. Um, just cause I thought if I'm going to spend all my time on this, that's the kind of area I want to be in. And so there was really only two companies that were on that list. I reached out to both of them. One I didn't hear back from then North Terrace. I did hear back from, we had some conversations. I, I'd have to go look back on my email, but I think we even got to a, a price at that time over the course of a few months. And then we had a disagreement over working capital. And uh, as you'll hear a lot of people say, uh, where, you know, owner thought it was his and I thought you should get some working capital. And it was enough of a disagreement. I felt at the time that it's not going to work. So we said, Hey, you know, let's talk again down the road. Maybe things will change. But for now, um, I don't think this is a fit. Uh, then sort of after that conversation, we went on to sell the agency business and join that private equity firm, both my partner and I, um, and, uh, bought a few businesses for them. And then in the middle of that period of time, moved back to Kansas city, continued working for the private equity firm. Uh, they're pretty like geographically agnostic on a certain level and, um, started itching to really make a go at buying something. Um, then I mentioned briefly, my partner and I left that private equity firm and kind of flew a flag that we were going to go buy business business or businesses. It was a little, uh, uh open-ended. Um, and while we were looking for opportunities, we, found what we thought was a good opportunity in kind of the insurance lead gen space. And we started a business there. Um, it was cool domain eligibility.com and mm -hmm. started building that out. And so it was truly a startup and, uh, it just, it did not become anything, unfortunately. Um, and so that was kind of a year, um, of focusing on something that, uh, it was a good experience, but, um, could feel that it was like, we're running out of money. We got to do something. I then went back to that conversation and I had been running the real estate portfolio on the side this whole time and went back to the owner of North Terrace and said, Hey, I'm interested again. And I, I need to make a move and we can get past that issue we had before. Like I'll make it work. I don't care. Um, because now in retrospect, it was pretty trivial. I think it was a $50,000 difference kind of a thing. And ultimately opportunities, good opportunities are so finite. And I was so specific in thinking, you know, I want this company that manages this kind of property and, you know, a long laundry list of things that, that this company met. So to lose the opportunity over, okay, industry standard is working capital works this way we're not seeing eye to eye. Like I should just eat that and chalk it up to paying more for the business if I still like the price. Um, yeah. So that conversation was uh, October, November-ish of 2016. And we ended up closing March 1st of 2017. And so that was, that did it. That, that sticking point on working capital really was all that needed to be removed for the deal to progress. Once Pretty you much, said that, there he, was, he was in. There was some stuff in the meantime that helped a lot on the seller side. Obviously, I take no credit for any of that. Um, he had just happened to exit a few deals that um, the company obviously managed, multifamily deals. So that took out some of the issues with, it's super common, and this is now an issue with, with my business, like it'd be pretty difficult to sell because a large percentage of what we manage are deals that I'm an owner in. So why would I, not why would I want to sell that, but how could I sell that and how would that work? It gets kind of hairy for sure. Um, he had sold um, everything at that moment uh, unrelated to me potentially buying the business because it was all before the conversation had started again. He had also bought a farm kind of 45 minutes away and was liking spending more time there. Uh, I had already demonstrated that I had some of the more difficult things I think to find in somebody that would buy this sort of business, like just the like block by block kind of like obsession with real estate 
in the areas that we focused in. Like it's sort of hard to put a teaser out and say buy a property management company and then hope that the person that presents themselves just has that, you know, and he recognized that that was fairly unique. Um, so it was just sort of fortunate, perfect timing when we came back around to it. Why is a block by block real estate obsession? I love that, by the way. Why is that uh, something that's critical in in property management? I can understand that if you're going to be a real estate agent or if you're going to be a real estate investor, buyer, but a property manager, they don't need to have their finger on the pulse of the of the values of the market as much, do they? As the as those other groups I just said. Um, well, for one, it was a pretty concentrated client base. You know, we had about 800 units under management. Um, when I purchased the business today, for context, we're about double that. Um, but uh, I have a, you know, elaborate client concentration thing that I prepared for the business plan that I had to create for an SBA loan. And I don't remember exactly the sort of tail on it, but the top five clients probably represented half the business. And then it, you know, kind of fell off after that. So knowing what I know now, I don't find that very concerning. Obviously at the time it felt very concerning and any reasonable lender is going to bring that up as a potential big deal, um, as they should. And, uh, being able to demonstrate credibility to those clients and to the lender through just like, you know, we start talking about a property that we manage or one that we could manage, whatever. And I can say, oh, well, I know that was owned by so-and-so at such and such point and they sold it and bought this. And just like all this, you know, deep domain knowledge that you would expect to take years of, of like being in the business to have, if I, I walked into it with some level of that, um, it's a lot more f plausible that I'm not going to like lose yeah. these clients because I don't know what I'm doing or I don't know the market yeah. or whatever the case may be. Tell us a little bit more about North Terrace. You said it was it had 800 doors, 800 units under management. Uh, what else can you tell us about it at the at the moment and when you bought it? Sure. Well, at the moment that I bought it, um, we were certainly more you know quote unquote old school. I guess um, that's somewhat the business and somewhat just you know the market has changed. Um, one of the things that I really liked about property management is I felt like um, it was 10 years behind a lot of other businesses. I think maybe that's, maybe it's not 10 today, but it's still a few years. You know, the things that have, have become industry standard in say plumbing or HVAC or even more progressive like lead generation industries like mortgages, the way that a lead has worked for instance in the mortgage space and go fill out a quick and loans <laughs> yeah. form and then like, God help just, you. <laughs> yeah, brace yourself. It's going to be hell for the rest of your life, essentially. Yeah. Um, it's the complete opposite in property management. It's you got to work super hard to get like a single callback. And I found that really attractive. Um, and we still have, yep. you know, super long ways to go uh, on getting to that level that I want to be at. You know, I don't think I want to be quick and loans of lead generation, you know, how we work a lead, but still there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, but we were extremely old school when I bought the business, um, you know, didn't take online payments. It was like you come in on Monday morning and there's some $20,000 in money orders on the floor, which is like terrifying to me to think about now, but that was like every Monday morning, um, <laughs> with like the two by four, in the brackets holding the door closed kind of a thing. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of other good examples of how old school we were. I mean, no, the resident portal pretty much only advertised on Craigslist, just kind of like the, you know, doing business like it was 2000 or even before, maybe even um, yeah. today. It's not like we're, you know, bleeding edge tech progressives or whatever. Um, but for the property management industry, especially for kind of this smaller scattered site, small apartment building space, um, we at least have all the basic blocking and tackling done that you would expect in larger buildings, the obvious resident portals and 
online payments and we have a more professional office. It doesn't, you know, <laughs> when I bought the business, the office had all these like little pony walls and you could hear every single conversation that anyone ever had. There were no private offices, which was like crazy um, to me and drove me nuts. So I'd always be outside on my phone. Um, so yeah, we've made a bunch of incremental changes like that, but, uh, and employee wise, we're probably about double, uh, what we, so that's kind of tracked. Um, I think we are kind of at a tipping point though now where incrementally you can, we can add units faster than we have to add labor on the management side, which is an interesting tipping point, obviously to be at, um, and we've they call that they call that scale, Brandon. That's the that's there we go. the, that's uh, the word, word of choice. Word I'm not supposed to say, <laughs> right? But um, so yeah, it's and and Brandon, how how can you give us some revenue numbers around where it was and what it is today? Um, and and headcount, you said doubled, but how how many people then and now? Yeah, when I bought it, it was it was twelve or so, and we're about twenty five today. Okay. Um, and today we're. Four million ish year in revenue, and when I bought it, we were million and a half. There's a lot of pass through, so that number gets kind of um, it doesn't necessarily track with uh, the reality of what's going on in the business. For instance, there was a year that we had a huge rehab project. The way that we do accounting, which is not the way every property management company does accounting, is that flows through us, theoretically. Like it depends on what the, what it is, but like on that large rehab project that we bought all the materials for, that kind of that did flow through us the materials. So you know, it's like a half a million dollar spike, but it's not at the same margin as regular revenue. If that makes sense. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, and, and you're just kind of reminding me of something that a property, a, a service that a property management business might deliver for its clients. Let's step back and just, I'm sure everybody knows what property management is, but just in case, and so that we're all on the same page, give us 60 seconds on what property management does and, and the suite of services that it, that it offers to its clients and what its typical client looks like. Sure. So like I mentioned, we focus on scattered site multifamily. So that's 10 to 100 units for the most part. Uh, we do have a little bit that's larger than that where there's staff on site. But our typical property is, let's say it's 40 units. Um, this, the staff all works out of our central office. Uh, we don't um, have a single person that does essentially everything on the management side for that business in the way that you would if you had, say, a 200 unit apartment complex and you've got someone on site to do all of the management functions. They're going to do everything. So, the services specifically that we provide to a property, we do the leasing. So, we're going to market it online, uh, you know, coordinate professional photography and 3d tours. We pretty much do those on every unit. Um, leads are going to come in. We're going to work the leads, do showings, process applications, um, process renewals, just everything around, uh, keeping occupancy high essentially. Um, and then the actual, you know, management of the property is, uh, get, getting, um, bids from vendors on contract services. So that's things like your trash, if that's not covered by the city, uh, pest control, uh, landscaping and lawn care, uh, just everything that goes into running a property. And then, you know, holding those service providers accountable, um, paying the bills, doing bookkeeping for the property. Um, and then we do maintenance and turns, which are two different functions in our business. They're not uh, carried out by the same group of people. So a tenant has an issue in a building and tells us, hey, X small thing is happening. We do that with in-house labor as opposed to calling up you know, a handyman or something every time something happens. Uh, and that's our maintenance department. And then make ready or turns, uh, kind of the industry terms, uh, is after a resident moves out, we then obviously have to get that ready for the next 
unit or next person that's going to move in and be able to market the unit and make it look presentable. That is a separate department from maintenance. Um, and typically that's a relatively small scope of work, but maybe 20% of the time it's like a large renovation and at large in our terms is say $30,000 per apartment or less where we're doing like real upgrades, you know, might be new counters or new cabinets and counters, new vanities, new flooring, et cetera. Um, so yeah, just kind of everything that goes into running a property day to day, there is a murky line between, especially at this size, between property management and asset management. Asset management is the higher level thinking of, hey, what, basically, the in my opinion, an asset manager makes the business plan and gives it to a property manager to enact the business plan. So we're supposed to be just enacting business plans. What happens, though, more often than not at this size is you have an owner who's um, not focused on it full time and isn't necessarily a sophisticated uh, real estate investor. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's it, again, they're not focused on it full time and they're not, they don't have a professional sort of asset management program that they put every property on. So we end up bleeding into doing asset management as well, uh, which sometimes is good and other times is, is frustrating because it's, uh, uh, thankfully none of the clients we work with right now are like this, but at times there are clients who think basically, you know, I bought a property, my job is done. Here's a spreadsheet that a broker gave me. Now make this happen, you know? Um, and it's not that simple. It's an ongoing thing where the owner has to be an asset manager so that we can be effective property managers. Well, so you're saying that if I am a rich person who bought a 50 unit building because I just want to park my capital there and, 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 and people will say that, that, uh, while, while passive income is, is, is elusive and, and often the, the, it's an over promise that you might get something like that, that in fact, in real estate, if you can get it, if you buy big enough that a property manager can just do everything, but you're saying that even then, not really, because unless you're also hiring an asset manager or also charging the property manager with explicitly with the doing the asset management as well, you got to think about it more than just make sure, you know, the place is leased up and it's maintained. You got to think strategically about it. Somebody's got to be making those decisions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, it's uh, it's akin to the joke that you made earlier in our conversation about, so you're telling me you just installed an operator? Uh -huh. You know, um, we are management for the business, but uh, without, um, you know, we don't have time to divorce ourselves from the day to day constantly and be thinking higher level. Uh, the owner has to do that. Um, and if they're interested in something being totally passive, then they should probably invest with a real estate GP who then that is their value add. They are an asset manager and, uh, you know, it's just not feasible for us to go and constantly shop every comp or whatever, you would put in that asset management bucket. We try to, as a value add, go a lot further than typical property managers would. And it's sort of like a bonus that we'll give feedback on that, you know? Um, but yeah, it is not passive as, as you might be led to believe. But, and why wouldn't you just offer asset management as a, an additional and premium service that is paid for optionally? We should. I mean, it's, um, it's an interesting uh sort of case study and understanding what you're buying basically where um there was that like i mentioned the client concentration and a lot of the reason i think that those clients chose north terrace was because and north terrace was really just uh, it wasn't just the seller but you know more or less at that time it was the seller he was a lot more involved with each individual client than i am we have just more structure and um hierarchy where there's certain things that I'm just, there's certain clients where I'm really just not that involved. We just do property management and that's sort of the end of it. But for instance, at that time, he wrote all of the monthly reports for every single property. I don't do that now. Um, I'm involved with bigger clients and involved on my deals, but there's a lot of deals that I don't really see much month to month. And I kind of look at it quarterly or annually. 
Um, so he sort of offered that asset management to everyone at no additional charge. So, um, and it was totally blurred, you know, um, and I don't think he called it asset management. It was just, um, you know, the business was started because he managed a property of his own and a neighbor basically said, you're doing great. Like, would you manage mine? And it just mushroomed that way. And so he just didn't think of it any other way. So it was, I don't think it was purposely a growth strategy, but that's what it ended up being. There are, to use your earlier word, that rhymes with so many seller profiles where they were, they they kind of fell into the business because they were doing something themselves and, and a business grew around them. And so many of their clients, at least their early clients, they knew personally and they just over-delivered and over-delivered and over-delivered. And when a new buyer, you, comes in and really needs needs to professionalize that and set some boundaries, um, it's a bit of a pickle because you have to now kind of kind of claw back some of the services that, that the clients were, get, were getting for free from the seller uh, and start charging for them or figure out some other way to, to, de to, to deliver them that, that's profitable to you. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's, there is an additional added um, kind of wrinkle in property management where at times it feels like everything we charge for is a direct like value destroyer essentially for the client or our property. We're this weird dynamic where we're both partners and we're their foe in a sense, because uh, if we just start charging more, it's seen as at times, or at least in the short term, revenue is kind of finite, but expenses could be infinite if we start charging for things. And obviously that's how you value a property. Um, so if you used to get a service for free and now it's charged, you're paying for it. Um, not only are you paying for it, but you're also multiplying that through, you know, at a multiple the way the property is valued. So it's really a big deal. So I have been more focused on let's figure out how we can generate revenue for the properties. And then occasionally I say, Hey, look, we've done X, Y, and Z. I need to charge for this in this way now. You know, so yeah. I lead lead with the value, obviously, and then try and ask for a little bit of it back. And is the is the kind of counter point to them? You know, yes, this is some money up front. Yes, it might look like it hurts your, you know, when you take the cap rate, it, it might hurt. Basically, I'm just looks like might look like I'm destroying a little bit of value of this asset. You probably don't want to use that word, um, but in fact. You know, I'm 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 tending to your business, your asset, and in the long term, this is simply an investment. You're investing a little bit more now for you know a better maintained property, higher rents, whatever it might be uh, over time. Yeah, I mean, a good example is we over the last two years switched our leases to go from 30 day notice when somebody wants to leave to 60 days. Um, which has pretty much become the industry standard, at least in Kansas City, that everybody does 60 days. Well, the sort of old school is we would always do 30 days. And in fact, when I bought the business, everything rolled month to month after the initial year. We didn't do any renewals. And that drove me insane because on a 12-unit property, three, four people move out. It sounds like a very dramatic percentage. Oh my gosh, we're 25% vacant. Well, yeah, we would be that's just three people. You know, it's a very kind of law of, of small numbers hurting you. Um, and so for one, we started doing renewals. They're not a ton of work, but it's, it's. I mean, to go from not doing them at all to doing them is work. So we, we did them for a while for free, and then we started charging. And the predictability then of locking in your revenue versus not, everybody has come around except for one um, and agrees with that. And is like, yes, this is really nice. I can actually tell my exposure month to month how many people could be leaving. And then as part of that switch from 30 to 60 days, we do a, we never used to do anything prior to someone moving out, except in rare circumstances, to understand what condition that unit was in and prepare for what the turn or the renovation is going to look like. They would move out. Then within a handful of days, we get over, we do an inspection, and then um, decide what to do. Well, with a 60-day window, it's far enough that you can go, say, 40 to 50 days out 
do that inspection and figure out, oh, this is a big deal. Like, here's the scope of work. Here's a general idea of what the budget's going to look like. And you can be ready to start, you know, start work within a few days of that move out, not start planning within a few days yeah. of that. So sure. our, and that we charge a little bit for that inspection, but it more than pays for itself in the fact right. that units are coming online like a month earlier. Well, that's a, uh, a great segue, Brandon. You talked about the proverbial, the proverbial fax machine earlier. Swap out the fax machine, put in some SaaS tools, and you've transformed the business. Uh, ha ha. It's that yeah. easy. <laughs> but there are, but there are levers to pull in all of these um, businesses that are not very tech forward or haven't really been um, kind of looked at strategically for a long time. What were some of the fax machine opportunities in your business? You've already given us a few, but I know there are more. Yeah. So our website was not attractive. It was like a, you know, a web builder kind of a thing where you, it's almost like a word document that you're building the website in and you upload it on the FTP server or whatever. Yeah. So modernizing our presence online for sure. Um, we never used to use professional pictures. Part of that stemmed from um, the fact that how our pricing scheme worked still, but but for sure then was basically you pay a management fee and that's inclusive of everything, including marketing. So any expense that you know we would bear was just on us. So if I have to pay for every unit turn to get professional photography and it's just out of my side it's not covered by the client that's a huge expense um but then just kind of like the example i just gave about increasing turn times it's pretty obvious that professional photos are going to help rent units faster so we basically said hey i'm sorry but we're not going to cover this cost but we would love to do it so put it on the client and everybody's opted in and now there's a library built up and it's not, it's sort of a one-time expense for the most part. Um, so we've, um, basically a lot of branding stuff is what I'm driving at. Um, yep. and taking online payments because you think of just the work that goes into, it used to be a check would come in. We didn't have any check scanners in the office we would prepare physical deposits. You can imagine the big, you know, with 50 or 60 properties, the big file folders where they're separated by owners and we're separating deposits and we've got to go twice a week for the first two weeks of the month and then once a week for the second two weeks of the month and on and on and on. Um, now, for the last, say, three years, I think it was about two years, well, no, two or three years into my ownership, that we mandated online payments. And there are still stragglers for one reason or another that do not pay that way, but it's 95% plus. And that every step that goes into processing a check is now just, you know, they pay it online and it's in the, it's in the operating account. Um, and it's basically reconciles itself. So that's an extreme amount of administrative work that's saved. Um, we used to do physical in-person lease signings, which, I'm always uncomfortable, you know, when I go to buy a car or something like that. Um, you're constantly in these situations where you're signing a legal document, but you really don't have an opportunity to review it, like realistically, unless you're the person that's just going to sit in the office for six hours. And that was not by design. That wasn't why North Terrace did it that way, but that's just the reality. Here's your lease, sign it and get out of here with your keys. We now send that all ahead of time via and do e-signature and then the day you move in just come in and pick up a copy and some keys and thank you gift or whatever um so that's like another one of those things where instead of spending 30 minutes with every single person it's like a five minute thing and a better outcome for them um and super organized on the back end because we don't have to like scan a lease it's already in the system um so I'm trying to think of other good examples it's just an infinite list of tiny little optimizations like that basically um you know using uh we weren't cloud-based before we had a server but it was physical so you think about you go inspect a unit what does that look like well everyone of course uses their personal phone they've got the pictures on there 
They all have their own separate way of how they get those pictures onto the server. Maybe they email them to themselves. Maybe they plug their phone in and move it over on the computer, but it's slow. They probably forget half the time because it's like clunky to go do something in the field, have to come back to the office and finish the process. So now I'm like crazy about like any work that's performed that's going to end up on our, um, we use Microsoft, uh, in the, our kind of um, server, quote unquote, that's in the cloud, needs to originate there. Unless it's just like in some program that you can't do it that way. But don't start a Word document, save it on your computer and move it in there. Like originate it there so that I can see, everyone can see that it's been started um, and photos the same way. Um, so just very long list of things like that. No, no single thing that's like incredible, but they all add up to a lot of efficiency and organization that's, you know, our lives can go haywire pretty quickly if little things are not organized. So Brandon, it feels like when I hear that, that in fact, your opportunity set was, this is the fax machine story. Yeah, I would say that it, it was. Um, or I the would, hundred fax machines, maybe yeah. I should say. And there's not one, you can't do it in one fell swoop, but a hundred small things, as you said at the very end there, add up. Yeah. I think the, the cliche with the fax machine is that that's the, your job is complete once you get rid of the fax right. machine. So, um, that's just, uh, you know, it's all just table stakes in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and there's still a laundry list of things like that, that we still do in an old school way. It's, it's interesting. Um, I like many, uh, small business buyers probably have not even seven years later spent as much time in each individual department as I probably should. Um, it's one of the flaws, I guess, with the fact that this business is also uh, like I'm buying real estate all the time and deals can sometimes take up a lot of time. So they take you off working on the business. Um, but I'll get into some department and, um, realize, okay, we don't need to do this this way. Like there's no reason that a, a good example recently is our bank reconciliations were very manual and we do a lot of them because every property has at least one operating account. Sometimes they've got reserve accounts or other things, you know, beyond that. Um, so call it 150 bank reconciliations every month. And that's just monthly. I'd rather that happen weekly or even daily. Um, and that's just like crazy to imagine giving the way that's, that that happens now, which is, um, like taking a physical statement or printing off a statement or exporting it into Excel and side by side on two monitors doing uh, a reconciliation. Well, turns out no one had looked into the fact that the property management software platform that we have has kind of a, uh, like a mint.com style or QuickBooks online integration that through Plaid, you can log into almost any bank. So far, we haven't found one that it doesn't connect with. Uh, and it's doing 80%, 90% of the reconciliation for you. And that was just when we started using it with relatively complicated reconciliations. They'll get simpler over time because it won't be a month. It'll be a week or a day. So it'll instantly always be right. Um, so... I feel like there's always going to be opportunities like that to discover, but that just that one thing alone is probably, um, I think we figured out it uh, typically reconciliations take four man days now, uh, two people, two days, and this could turn it into like, a you know, an hour or two hours a week type of a thing. And Phenomenal. our data is really up to date. Well, I want to pivot now and spend some time on the, business of property management and some of this, you know, the, the strategic value of it ab above and beyond um, kind of the, the, the business operations itself. So it has, it has um, certain characteristics that we would look for in as searchers in a business. It's business, it's B2B. It is very recurring. It's, if you're doing a good job, maybe even if you're not doing a good job, it's very sticky because as we're kind of getting a sense for listening to your what you all do, you're you're really quite entrenched in in the operations of your of your clients' assets, their their properties. Um, it ain't going anywhere. It's not going to be disrupted by a robot or AI anytime soon. I mean, it's very kind of physical 
in some sense. Um, and, and, and it's extremely fragmented. So, you know, uh, North Terrace was a small business and there are countless, countless really tiny mom and pop property management comp- uh, businesses around, around the country. So it, it, there's probably more things that I'm overlooking. So a, a lot to like there. And then when you add in the real estate angle, if you've got aspirations of real estate, it, that's just kind of this interesting cherry on top. So let me put a pin on that. We're going to come back to it. Despite all the the pros that I just said, one screaming con that everyone will tell you about property management is that it's a really hard business. You know, services businesses generally are hard, but um, the property management is extra hard. <laughs> and we're getting just by listening to you, we're getting a sense of that. I mean, it's it's just a lot of moving pieces, um, people, properties, doors, units, owners, tenants, turnovers. I mean. And that's what you're being paid for, is managing all of that churn. Uh, so talk to us about that. What, what, what's it? What's a day in the life like? Why shouldn't every searcher listening to this go out and buy a property management business? Or should they? Um, well, it's starting off with a little aside. It's one major downside that popped in my head for whatever reason uh, during that question was the fact that I am envious of businesses that have uh, more pricing power than we have. We don't have much pricing power. I have started um, being less flexible on new clients. I was quick in the past to be very flexible on our fee schedule. And then I realized there's no reason to do that. Like it's just, I'm just giving away money and it's hurting us and it's, I'm going to feel it forever because once we start managing a property and the management fee is X, there's no raising that. Um, and I mean, I don't think I've ever done that. So I, yeah, there's no case where we raise it versus using my example of the, uh, the fence business that we looked at. Everyone knows that uh, over the last few years, those sorts of service providers, sure, the inputs got more expensive, but no problem. Just adjust the output and figure out a place where you've gone too far and dial back or, you know, you can be more dynamic in how you adjust for things. That's very- And Brandon, is that is that something intrinsic to property management or is that just the difference between recurring and project-based work? Where in recurring, it's a little bit, that actually might be one of the flaws of recurring is that it's hard to raise your prices because you're you're not going to market every time you, you know, whereas pro- project-based, you're, you're re-going to market all the time. So you can choose to raise your prices pretty and, 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 you know, much more frequently. I think that's true, but I think it's like really accentuated in property management kind of for the reasons that I said earlier, where every dollar that we make is a dollar that a property doesn't make. And it's, you know, then call it $20 in value for that property that if you look at it that way as a finite thing where revenue is unchanged, um, so yeah, I think you're right. That is an issue recurring versus project, but it's like even more significant here. You know, I get price increases on software platforms that we use annually and I don't say I never expected right. this price right. to go up. Um, right. and the interesting thing is we, so we get a, we get a raise too every year as rents go up, but that doesn't track with our expenses. So, you know, a recurring software platform that raises their price, it could be 5% one year and 20% the next year and 3% the next year. And they could respond more directly to the actual inputs. Whereas we really right. can't. Um, it's we're at the mercy of the market and our fee is a percentage of that. And that percentage is rarely changing on existing clients. Um, so. and, and, and Brandon, isn't it also kind of intrinsic to property management because there's kind of an industry expectation of what property management should cost. It's like, what is it, like 8 to 12% or something? Yeah, that's a- Maybe that's that's as a a consumer, that's as an individual. That's a single family kind of pricing scale. Our apartments are less than that. Um, Okay. But yes, you're right, there is. And there's there's almost like, I don't think there's any room for, if you said, hey, we charge 15%, but look, we get uh, 25% higher rents it's like it wouldn't pass the smell test, even if you could demonstrate it. Or it'd be very difficult to demonstrate what do you, it, I guess. What do you mean it wouldn't pass the smell test? People would just be like, I don't, I just, as a rule, I would never pay 15% I see. property I management. See. Even if it was like, look, Nat, you're making a lot more money. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. and that's like a pretty extreme example because I'm doubling 
the typical fee essentially. But um, even if it was a tighter kind of range than that, hey, we we don't charge seven like our competitor, we charge nine. But here's what you get. That would still probably get some pushback. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's tough. That's one thing not to like for sure. Um, yeah. That's a big one. And in terms of you're right. You do kind of, you have a lot of, a lot of masters and it's, and they're kind of in conflict with one another. You've got, um, I don't know if you mentioned vendors as another constituency, <laughs> but that's another constituency that we have where, you know, we've got clients, residents, vendors, and employees, and they're in a way on the same team, but also in a way all in conflict with one another. Um, so it's extremely difficult to manage that balance. And I'd say that's the biggest challenge. It's not the, you know, the, I think the cliched thing that people will say is, you know, toilets or whatever in the middle of the night, but you can solve those kinds of issues with pretty low scale. Somebody on call, it's not that big of a deal. Stuff hmm. happens over time. It's just normal small business problems, essentially. Um, but that constant sort of tension between, um, how do you deliver the message to a resident that I'm sorry you're unhappy with X, but it's not in the budget. And, you know, we don't think that when you lease that apartment, there should have been an expectation of X being as good as you're hoping for. It's just, yeah. there's a lot of like murky nuanced situations like that where there's no good closure for them. And it's frustrating to, sort of be the on the chopping block for that because you know we don't we're not gonna throw our client under the bus and say hey i'm sorry um you know uh will owns this property and he's really not interested in paying for that right now you know well it's it's a good point too that maybe correct me if if wrong the one of the difficult parts of this business is that you're the you you where you sit, you get to absorb all of the negative energy of the tenants. <laughs> You're the buffer yeah. between uh, the, that, the, the tenant and the owner. Um, you're always the bad guy. You're always the one just, yeah, like I said, absorbing that energy and having to kind of try to diffuse it if you can. It's true. Um, we deal with that in a few ways. One way we deal with that is by just vetting the owners and the properties that we will work with on the front end. Um, we're not mercenaries. Uh, and if you can tell that the person is, is not going to be good to work with, just get, kind of get those signals, then we're not going to do it. Um, that's not how we're going to say it to them, but just, you know, probably going to blame it on the property or something. And then if the property is not a fit, that's pretty easy to just say, I, I mean, usually people aren't emotionally attached and you could just say, Hey, I'm sorry, this is just kind of a crummy property. We don't want to do this. Um, and so that's, that's one way we deal with it, vetting on the front end. Um, I'm also, I don't put us in positions where I'm afraid to walk away from a client. You know, we don't get in too deep. So if, if a client seems great, but then an issue happens and they say, you know, whatever the issue is, I'm sorry that this really terrible thing happened, uh, but I'm not going to pay with pay for that. You know, we would say, okay, fine, then we're not going to work with you. Um, and then we do a lot to try and they're very small things, but try and be, um, not just, there's this kind of like old school landlord, uh, ethos of like, you know, we do what the lease says and that's the end of it kind of not like customer service oriented at all. Um, and it's pretty basic stuff, but like we do a little move in gift that I mentioned earlier when they sign a lease we actually leave it in the unit. We don't give it to them when they come into the apartment. So it starts off with our leasing team is great. They're very like, that's the fun part of leasing an apartment. So it's kind of easy to be really positive there. Um, they make sure it's a great experience. Then the first interaction they have with us when they move in on moving day is they've got a surprise little gift bag from us. And it's got, you know, it's kind of like useful stuff and it's a water so that they can take a break from moving and like just kind of thoughtful um, and nice. then, yeah. And we check in with, them. um, we do like a bonus program for one of the things I'm always talking about on Twitter is Google reviews. We do a bonus program where we ask, Hey, how did, um, 
that service order go today? If they say it was good, if it was bad, we deal with it. If it was good, then we say, Hey, we'll give a $10 bonus to the maintenance tech that, um, did that today. Uh, if you just mention them by name in a Google review and we really yeah. follow through and that has been an amazing hack and it's like, it kind of spreads throughout the business and, um, so we also then give a bonus quarterly to whoever gets the most Google reviews on top of just the per review mention. Yeah. Um, and it's, it allows everyone to talk about a lot more positive things and, you know, not get so down when they're only dealing with complaints, you know, that's a great little hack. And I feel like anybody running any sort of business where they're interacting with the public and they, their teams are interacting with the public, you could, doesn't have to be property management. You could offer a same sort of incentive that's um, to to the consumer, and that that indirectly trickles up to the to your st- to your crew people. Yeah, and it's uh, that one has been very successful for us. One of the things that you said in the pre call, Brandon, was that um, because the business is so difficult, the business of property management so, is so difficult. Rather than seeing that as a negative, you saw that as opportunity. Can you just articulate what you meant there? Yeah, I mean. I think it, like I just mentioned, that old school attitude of we do what's in the lease and that's it. Um, dropping that attitude, for one, to the extent that it's possible because you that doesn't inherently have a limit. Like, yeah, sure, we could come and do your laundry for you too. We'd probably be everybody's favorite landlord if we did that. So within reason, what we can afford to do, um, just not having that attitude um, and being customer focused without uh, it having any sort of, not only does it not have a negative implication for our business or for our clients in terms of like costing them more because we're just like, oh, you know, screw it on the late fees or whatever. Like we're enforcing policy, um, but we're doing it positively and we're doing a lot of stuff uh, above and beyond. Um, So I would say that's the main way that we've um, kind of dealt with that challenging opportunity um, and not just, you know, sort of been frustrated. Okay. Well, we're, we're bumping up on time, Brandon, and I want to spend the rest of it talking about h- how this can complement a, somebody building a real estate portfolio. I asked you on our pre-call, are you a real estate guy with a property management business or vice versa, property management business guy? with some real estate holdings and you self-identify as a real estate, you're real estate first. So we've spent mo- most of our conversation talking about property management business because this is a searcher audience, but now let's let's bring them together. And for anybody listening who either already has real estate or aspires to build a real estate portfolio um, and more than just you know a couple units, but something substantial and really build wealth over years, over the long term. Um, how talk to us about how owning a property management business has served that goal and how it fit, how it all fits together. Yeah. I mean, it, um, it makes me think again of that comment that you kind of made about, Oh, it turns out real estate's not as, as passive as we've been led to believe. Um, it's not, it's a business just like any other business. I think that there is more infrastructure in place in the real estate in- industry to allow it to be, a more passive business than, you know, just buying a whatever operating business in another state. Like it's feasible to think that you could buy an apartment complex in another state and there are people you can find and put together a team to run that business for you. But it is still a business that you have to oversee. And um, that's what I want. I wanted to build a big portfolio and to give me the time uh, and space to oversee that business. This is the clearest path, uh, was, you know, find a, an operating business that allows me to focus on my real estate portfolio. Even though I am a real estate guy with a property management business, I actually spend way more of my time on the property management business than being the real estate guy. I'd like for that to like shift over time. And it has shifted in the right direction over the past few years, for sure. Um, to where it was, you know, sort of 95, five on, 95 operating the business and five on looking for deals and putting them together. And it's, it's gone in the right direction where it's a lot kind of closer to an even split. Um, and that's part of what, I don't know, inspires me to work on the business though, to accelerate that shift. Um, but just there's, 
there's a million advantages. Um, you know, I know what things cost because we do projects for clients. And if I was just that client, I wouldn't have that exposure. Um, I get a lot of inside information on transactions from either things that we are a party to in some way, like we're managing it or whatever it is, or brokers are just more apt to share information with me. Um, because you know, if we have clients that are going to sell or if I'm personally going to buy something, uh, you know, they want to be there to do a deal with me. So, or one of my clients. So it just puts me in the middle of a lot of opportunities and a lot of interesting information that you would just be on the outside of if, if you were not running this business. Um, and I, I do have a funny analogy that I often make, um, Please. that I, I don't know if I mentioned in our pre-call, but if someone said to you, Hey, I want to buy apartment building. Let's say I live in on the West coast. I want to buy apartment buildings in the Midwest. I've done the research. Kansas city is great. Um, I have started talking to people about deals and now I just need to hire a property management company uh, to kind of make it all happen and come to life. And I'll, I'll give them the spreadsheet and they can do it. Okay. That I'm saying it in a little bit of a flippant way, but it doesn't sound that crazy. But if you change that from real estate to anything else, you said, uh, I always say barbershops, for whatever reason. But if you said, I've identified that barbershops are uh, undervalued in Kansas City and they charge too little for haircuts and it's sh actually shocking. They, uh, the haircuts look just the same there as they do in LA. And all I got to do is uh, find the uh, barbershop management company who will put my business plan into practice and execute it perfectly. You'd be like, this person is insane. Uh, <laughs> this is the worst idea I've ever heard. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if, if I just had to gratuitously get that uh, illusion that I like to make in there. But that's um, good. That's kind of why you always, as a owner, have to at least plan to do the asset management because it's just it is not that simple um, that you can just flip it over to somebody and it'll come out the way that you were promised. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, we've we've all been tricked into thinking uh, that's possible. Even even I have been tricked into thinking that's possible to a higher degree than it is seeing it fail over and over. Well, okay, so you do you have just explained that be owning a property management company does have this kind of knowledge flywheel effect of being a player in the local market. You you, you got access to all of these all this information that you might not otherwise in people too, uh, presumably. Let's take the question of property management owner and real estate uh, portfolio owner in three parts. So if you ha already have a real estate portfolio, which you did, if you don't, nor do you have any intention of building one, well, how does property management look to, as, a, as a business to get into? And finally, if you don't yet have a real estate portfolio, uh, is is prop buying a property management company maybe an accelerant to get there? So you didn't have to memorize those. I'll take them one by one. <laughs> so the first one was was you, Brandon. Like for somebody who already has more than like a unit or two or three, but maybe a substantial portfolio, and they're entrepreneurial. They're not just a real estate investor. They might want to buy a business or have a business one day. It sounds like at least based on your experience, buying a real a property management business makes sense. How would you what would you tell that person? Yeah, if they're going to actually operate the business or have a partner that's going to actually operate the business and they'll really be involved, um, then yes, I think it makes sense. Um, if they're just doing it to say we have our own management company, but they're not going to be that involved, then I think it's a lot more of a toss up whether that makes sense. I, d I have seen clients uh, of ours who said we're going to bring management in house and started a property management company, but we're not like in the business themselves, and it did not go well. You you should at that point just hire somebody like us, um, yeah, because it's effectively yeah. the same thing. Great. Now, what if you are just a searcher, no interest in real estate? You don't have a portfolio, nor do you intend to build one. What what? So so the just the the the, the merits of property management 
without any kind of strategic play into into a real estate asset builder, what would you say to that person? Is it a we, we've talked about the pros and cons, but would you say look elsewhere or what would you tell that person? I would tell that person at the moment, it's definitely a good momentum business. Uh, there is like um, institutional demand to kind of aggregate property management companies, especially in the single family space, where mm. if you had an opportunity to buy one or a few property management companies, um, there's a real opportunity to professionalize those and then sell them on. As a business that you're thinking, I might hold this forever, I don't see the point in doing it if you're not also going to be building a portfolio. That's what's so attractive about it is the fact that it's this rare business where the operating business you know, could double, for instance, like mine did in seven years. Um, but the your portfolio, like my portfolio, is... 20 times larger than it was when I bought the business. So business 2X, portfolio 20X. That's, I can't think of many other examples of businesses where um, you kind of move the client base in your direction a little bit more proprietary to your own deals or whatever it is in that other business and not scale the operating business kind of in lockstep. So that's really attractive and makes those kind of problems we were talking about before with all your kind of cons different constituents with opposing issues. Uh, it lessens the blow a lot when you think about it that way. Um, so I would say it's one of those two things. Either you're going to build a portfolio or you're optimizing a business to sell it on to kind of an aggregator. Um, just a pure third-party business that's going to be around forever I don't know if that's an interesting opportunity to me. Great. Thank you. Um, but let me just uh, double click on the 20x, your real estate, your real estate portfolio, 20x, your property management business doubled. Sorry. And so you're, you're saying that you 20x your real estate portfolio because of the strategic play that, that, it, that is North Terrace? Yeah. Like it wouldn't like if you had didn't have North Terrace, you wouldn't have twenty X to real estate portfolio. Correct. I would not have for sure. Okay. Okay, great. Well, that's pretty compelling. But what about the, you know, you had said going all the way back to the top when you were in private equity with your partner and friend, and you guys realized that like doing transactions was less fun to you, which is kind of like what you're kind of implying that that's what private equity, a lot of private equity is. If Assuming you're not on the operation side of private equity, you're like the private equity one doing deals. A lot of it's just doing deal after deal after deal or and yeah, and growing inorganically. And you really liked the idea of getting into a bit, buying a business and then getting into it and pulling the levers and making it grow. And you've done that in your property management business. Um, but we're also hearing that you've been doing a lot of real estate deals as well. And in fact, you'd like to shift much more of your attention to doing more real estate deals. So isn't doing real estate deals just that kind of just transaction by transaction by transaction, the same thing that you didn't turn you on about private equity? No, I classify them totally differently um, because uh, I don't want to say it's like easy to buy a property. It's certainly not easy, but it's nothing compared to buying a business and just the level of um, you know nuance that comes with buying a business. Uh, it, it's really when we buy like an apartment building, we're just buying a client. Uh, you know, it could be someone else could own that building and we manage it for them. And it's going to be basically the exact same output on our side. Um, or I might as well buy it or put together a group to buy it because it's going to be the same amount of work. And at least we also own the building. So no, yeah. it doesn't, it does not feel transactional in the same way. Like, and it also feels like it's building the business of having that portfolio, basically. Thank you again for your, I love that you take a position that just a property management business by itself, if you're not also pursuing a real estate portfolio or some kind of roll up and exit strategy, it's maybe not the most compelling place to focus your years of your life as a searcher. But what about one of the other kind of strategic fantasies people have about property management where 
you it, it it touches all the the vendor relationships that you talked about. You touch so many different vendors, general contractors, HVAC, all I mean, basically all the vendors that service the properties. You have these relationships with, and so you just know a lot of people. You're well networked in that world, but also you know rather than you know paying the you know the mechanical contractor who's a different business to go in and the landlord's paying them to go in then go into the building and fix something. If that mechanical contractor were owned by Brandon as well, it gets more interesting. And if, you know, if you, if you have this fantasy of kind of buying all of these different vendors up, so you own a property management company and all of its attendant vendors, what about that play? Cause I've heard that m- people talk about that many times. Is that realistic? I think it's interesting. Um, we haven't done a ton of that. There's definitely some, and so like using an example of something in our um, business that's kind of gone in and out of house a few times, um, groundskeeping, and then also snow and ice removal. Yeah. So um, groundskeeping used to be in-house, then we moved it out of house, then we moved it back in-house, and it was terrible that second time, and now it's like never again will it be in-house. I would rather put our efforts into um, negotiating and being like we, it creates a little bit of an adversarial relationship with the client. If, even if, you know, we use sort of industry standard practices to bid and, you know, there's no like um, bid rigging or whatever you want to call it to give it to us um, exclusively, we still have to, produce a great result of what's another very difficult business. I think groundskeeping is pretty hard. Um, so I would rather on things like that, just, um, focus on getting tons and tons and tons of bids and making a marketplace for vendors and then hold those vendors accountable. And when a client is unhappy, Oh, Hey, I drove by my property and it looked terrible. It's not like, okay, now I got this on my plate too of making sure that the landscaping division is good. You know, um, we can be more nimble and trade those vendors out. Um, And there's, you know, other reasons, liability reasons, specifically on snow where it's just like, okay, we can make a little bit of money, but do I want to deal with the slip and fall uh, lawsuit associated with the snow or would I rather just have a vendor deal with that because it's their problem? Um, So there are niches where it's interesting um, I think the more predictable kind of like CapEx type niches, it's more interesting than day-to-day service. So, um, you know, doing project management or construction management for bigger projects. And again, you're just kind of negotiating with individual vendors and coordinating projects, not self-performing. That's pretty interesting. Um, and we admittedly don't like charge very much for that right now. And we could probably charge more. Okay, Brandon, the the third case here was somebody who aspired to build a real estate portfolio over the course of their lives, their careers, but doesn't yet have one. Should they go out and get some, try to get in the real estate game first and then think about bolting on a property management business as you did? Or is buying a property management business as a searcher, operating it, you know, kind of getting their arms around it for a few years and then going out and starting to build a portfolio? um, Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that really makes sense. Uh, the second version that you said, where if I had, you know, I don't know, $250,000 and I could buy a small apartment building in Kansas City, or that's my uh, down payment and working capital to buy a small property management company with an SBA loan, I would buy the property management business. Um, because you immediately have a really, really interesting differentiator. You, you've bought a job, first of all, so you can focus on it full time buy one yep. small apartment building isn't going to tick that off um, the list. So you still have to fill your time with something that's going to kind of pay the bills. Um, so you've got that issue covered. Plus you have just a great entree into all the folks that control all the deals basically. Right. Um, right. So I think it's, yeah, it's a great hack. Do you think that you'll buy a business again or do you just have this, you're just getting closer and closer and closer to having this, real estate port growing real estate portfolio with property management business kind of serving it uh humming along that to buy a business or to think about buying a business would just be a distraction what do you think you'll ever return to eta proper 
I don't know. I struggle with that for the moment uh, for a variety of reasons. I'm definitely not buying anything. I would say probably at least five to 10 years. Um, <clears throat> I have a seven-year-old and a one-year-old, first of all. Um, and then, uh, so that's, yeah, that's enough of an explanation right there. But, um, <laughs> yeah. and I enjoy the flexibility that I, I've now kind of gotten to the point with this business where I can be pretty flexible. Um, I mean, there are times when it feels like I'm in the trenches still, but then there's other times like, um, the past couple of summers, I have just kind of worked 10 to two or three every day with my older son's schedule. And then we would do stuff outside of that. And it was a lot of fun. Um, so I want to maintain that while they're young, but then my wife and I bought another business that she runs and it's good sized. Um, certainly by like self-funded search standards, it's good size. Um, and so that really scratches the itch of buying another business and, you know, uh, buying a larger business, I guess. Um, and then there's the two married together is uh, well, literally married together, I guess, but, um, the two businesses, uh, married together is very interesting. And, um, her business, we acquired it about five years ago. Um, but we initially had some investors that we've since bought out. So there were things that we might've considered doing earlier, but now when it's just all ours, we can, we can do, um, you know, uh, it's kind of trendy Twitter stuff that you hear about, like shared services, you know, she's got, I have 25 employees. She's got 50 or 60. Um, and there's not a natural, um, synergy between the two businesses, but for example, both businesses need HR support and neither business has someone focused on like recruiting talent. Uh, both could probably afford somebody like half time to do that. Uh, yep. so the notion of, okay, this is interesting. Maybe we can bat a little bit out of our league by combining some of those needs a little bit. Um, we're just in the early stages of sort of going down that path. So I think that scratches the urge, uh, or itch to buy another business and, um, focused on optimizing what we have basically. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, uh, you, you got your hands full and, and also lots of entrepreneurial stimulation to go around a lot of interesting things. I mean, you guys, and by the way, uh, I, I, I really hope that uh, your wife's name is Katie. I really hope she, well, I'll convince you to convince her to come on because um, the business that she bought is a big kind of institution retail uh, f furnishings, furniture store in Kansas City. So between you, I'm, I'm seeing kind of this Kansas City power couple, the, the real estate magnate uh, and, and, uh, and, and the woman who owns, you know, a, a decades old, I don't know how old it is, but uh, a really well-known and well-respected and, and beloved um, furnishings store. Uh, really pretty neat. Um, what does, so I, I feel like, Brandon, it's fair to say without pumping your tires that this is going awesome for you that it's it's really working out uh, well. And as maybe with a lot of small business acquisitions, it's been a little bit slower than maybe you wanted, but it's certainly going in the right direction. Uh, and you're starting to, as you just, as you said an hour ago, you're starting to really feel the, um, that some good scales around the corner. Uh, what does it, what does a good outcome look like for you five or 10 years from now? And are you on your way there? Yeah, I mean, I would like, um, I would like uh, a team. I feel like um, I have g a good team, but there are some gaps. And I would like um, some of the things that I feel like I have to be involved with because we don't have the capacity uh, in house currently. Um, I would love to fill that in. So a great outcome would be to grow a little bit more to the level where. Uh, I felt like we could afford a few uh, additional kind of high level people. You know, we don't have like a CFO and that's, it's not a, necessarily a common title in a property management company. So that's not like surprising on the surface, but um, I would love to have, yeah, sort of a more sophisticated um, financial analysis team basically. Um, so yeah, I think, just growing to the point that I can afford 
to grow our team uh, in some areas would be great. Um, and then to feel, I mean, this directly related to that, then I would feel like, like right now, if I was to go on vacation for a month, I would be worried. I would be checking in a lot and just the classic kind of like small business type stuff. Um, I wouldn't feel like things were probably growing in my absence. Um, and I would love to sort of work on the business to the point that I didn't feel that way, basically, if I was gone. A little bit more of a um, self-sustaining thing, not something that I have to swoop in and fix stuff, although I you know, swoop in and make a lot of messes too. Um, so professionalizing and institutionalizing. Um, and then ideally, most of that growth comes from properties and partnerships uh, of my own. So it's more principally owned than third-party business as well. Anything I didn't ask you, Brandon, that you wanted to make sure that this, this audience heard? Can't think of anything. Okay. Well, what is a, a good way for people to reach out if, they're, if they have a question for you? Sure. Twitter's good. X, uh, my handle is my last name, Lafridge, L-A-U-G-H-R-I-D-G-E, uh, or email me, <clears throat> Brandon at North Terrace. Dot com. Great. I should say here that you did a a, uh, a thread on buying a business that went kind of viral back in 2020 uh, and got you, I guess, got you a lot of attention. I remember seeing it uh, and I feel like it's, I, I've seen it more than once. Uh, I have it here in front of me, but it basically just lays out a compelling argument for ETA. This was, um, I don't know, just the normies and the masses got a hold of it and it, and it, and it went viral, but uh, I'll, I'll link to it as well. It looks like it has 6,000 bookmarks. 6,000 people oh, have bookmarked it. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't it. know that number. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's actually the, the, of all the kind of KPIs of a tweet, that's the one that matters the most. Um, it's what people really want to save. So congratulations for, for 6,000 people um, pocketing one of the things, something you put out there. Well, Anyways, thanks. I'll and link to that in the notes. Twitter. Yeah presence is kind of underwhelming as of late. I just, uh, I don't know, last six, 12 months I've faded a little bit. So, um, yeah, I, un I unpinned that from my profile and then, uh, nobody liked me anymore. So I, I faded away, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll juice your profile a little bit by linking to it in the notes. There we go. Brandon Lawfridge, thanks for giving me so much of your time and being so transparent, fascinating to learn about, um, property management, real estate, ETA, and how they all work together. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I love, love the podcast. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you subscribe to the Acquiring Minds channel below. We are now publishing twice a week. So tons of new interviews and stories to come. Stories that will help you along your own path to acquiring a business.